Hey everybody, it's me, it's Lenora from It's a New Dawn. So this is probably my last recording for the year 2020. And uh, this recording is probably gonna come out in January, but uh, I'll be starting uh, season three in January on the podcast. I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I'm gonna ask before I start the podcast, if you would support me, you can, if you don't ask, you don't receive. So if you would go over to uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, anywhere where you listen and support me, subscribe, comment, you know, give me your feedback. I would greatly appreciate that. And I'm also on YouTube. It's a new dawn. So if you su subscribe there, I would greatly appreciate that support. Thank you so much. So it is uh, December. What's the, what's the date? December what? Fifth. Six? Is it fifth, the sixth? Five. Fifth. Fifth. Five. Okay, so it's December 5th, 2020. It's a rainy, cold day in Jersey. And uh, I don't know. I like it. I don't mind it. I'm sitting down with author Jesse A. Cruz. He lives in upstate New York with his wife and children. The Cruz family currently serves at Cross Creek Church. He has proudly served our country as an Iraq War veteran of the U.S. Army. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, Jesse is the program coordinator of the Wayne County Youth Advocate Programs. In addition to his career, he has been engaged in speaking at correctional facilities and coaching sports. He has a BA in community youth development at Nazareth College. Currently, Jesse is pursuing his master's in theology at Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School. In his spare time, he enjoys traveling, probably not so much now, right? And hiking with his family and friends. Uh, Jesse is available for speaking engagements and book signings. Um, I know he has written a book called um, Name Live Your Dash. What is it? Yep, Live Your Dash. Live Your Dash. And we spoke briefly about that and what I thought it meant, but I want you guys to all listen to his story. And um, I'm going to turn the camera over to you, Jesse. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. So when I, you know, some people who have heard the term labor dash or some people who have and haven't, but for those who haven't, um, the concept is actually from something that we all face in life. So there isn't really one person that this doesn't relate to. And so anytime a person has gone to a cemetery or looked at a, a, um, a tombstone, they'll see a, a birth date on the left and they'll have the date that they pass away on the right, but in the middle is a dash. And the purpose of this book is to teach people how to live their dash because everyone has a purpose and a meaning and a plan for their life. And this book lay, lays out eight different areas of our lives that if we're intentional about pursuing that we will live a purposeful life, therefore living our dash effectively and impacting those around us. Mm -hmm. And what led you to write this book? I mean, there's gotta be a story that led you to write so, this book and I wanna right. know it, I wanna know Absolutely, it. so actually what led me, what led me to the, you know, at the time, you know, one of the greatest accomplishments was becoming an author, you know, I mean, I thought that was great, you know, it was a beautiful thing, but what led to it was the greatest tragedy that I experienced, you know, and, you know, um, a few years ago, um, my wife and I, we had a child. She was born premature. So that was very traumatic for us. You know, I mean, she was she was supposed to be born in May and she ended up being born in January. Um, mm. So she was extremely premature, um, high mm. risk. And, you know, she was she was one pound. You know, I mean, she was literally one pound in, in weight and watching her every single day fight for her life. I mean, it was so hard on us. And, and there's still days where I think about it and it hurts, you know I mean? Watching what she had to go through on a daily basis. And, you know, I, I watched her flatline multiple times and then oh, come wow. back and, and emotionally drained me um, beyond belief. You know what I mean? And eventually after 42 days of fighting, she passed away. Oh my God. I'm so, so sorry. And you know what? Obviously it still hurts. And, but you know, I said, you know, oh. during that time, I, I grieved hard and, and I still do. Um, but I realized that, you know, I can, I can take what happened to me and, and let it destroy my life. And you know what it almost did? It, it almost was the end of my life um, because of the depression that I was in and the PTSD from 
what I witnessed and, you know, it was hard and it's still hard days, but I decided to use that experience as a way to, to honor her and to carry on her legacy. That's the best way I could do to keep her memory alive. And now this little one pound girl that no one has ever met before is touching lives all over this country and other countries. So um, it's just amazing the power of being able to share a story with people. I was not expecting that you to tell me that. I thought you were going to tell me that. Good. Um, I'm very sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. So that inspired you to write the book. Yeah. It's inspired me to um, do many things to reach many people because I feel like everyone needs to know that they're valuable, that they're important. You know, whether they live for 42 days or 142 years, that everyone has a story. You know, and that story needs to be shared with the world because there's only, you know, every person is so unique and so special. Um, and, and she was so unique and so special. You know, and I want to tell the world about her and, and how much she impacted my life. And because I'm able to do that, she's been able to impact people as well. Wow. So can you talk about the book? Like, how, where do you start? And um, is it only about the baby? Or is it about when you served in war? Tell me. Right. So, so the book, the concept of the book, you know, like I said, is to live a, a purposeful life. So I don't, in this book particularly, um, I don't really mention much um, about what happened in the hospital with her. That's for my second book that I'm currently working on. That's going to give a day-by-day -day life experience of what we went through. So the second book is about her life, specifically about her life. Um, this book is more about, is a personal growth and success book um, to talk about following these eight steps. Because as I started, I, I start, after she passed away, about two weeks later, I started writing. And I wrote every wow. single day. And then I wrote every single day. It was therapeutic for me. It helped me get through it. It helped me cope. I was going to say, it must have been therapeutic. And, and I felt like that was my way to visit How was your wife doing this whole thing, too? Like, how, how was your wife handling it? Was it, like, I'm sure it was a strain on your marriage. I'm sure all of these strained things. everything. It strained my work. It strained my relationship with my kids. It strained my marriage. It strained every avenue of my entire life. And it was painful. And it was a dark season of life. And... You know, and as I started writing, um, that was my, I felt like that was my only way to go visit her. I feel like if I just wrote, I could still talk to her, you know, so I would just write every single day. And then when I was writing, I started to see like this theme develop, you know, I mean, how, how my, how these eight areas of my life have been greatly impacted from what I just went through. Everything has been impacted. And so I started writing about these eight different areas. And then I said, man, these eight areas are relevant to, to everybody on earth whether they realize it or not, these eight areas are, are going to be impacting us on a daily basis. And so I just kept writing in those eight different areas. And then I was like, you know, I see a theme here. I'm going to turn this into a book. And I just kept writing, you know, I wrote it on pen to paper you know, I filled up an wow. entire notebook. And when I filled it up, I started typing it up and then I started editing it. And then I, you know, got a publisher and I hired an editor and I said, you know, I'm going to do this for her. And this is going to reach people all over the world. So, and it has, and I'm just thankful for it. Did you ever go to school for writing? I mean, just actually, I, ironically, so no, I didn't. And, and the irony of that is I actually have a learning disability. What actually, it actually makes me very difficult for me to um, understand reading. So I have like a reading comprehension, learning disability. So my writing can be also sporadic as well, because my, the way that I process my brain doesn't work like most people, um, which is makes it even more um, amazing to see that it was able to be effective. Um, so I didn't let that hold me back though. You know, I still decided I'm going to do it anyways, because that's what I feel like I've been called to do. Wow. And I want to, can we go over the eight areas? Absolutely. All right. Cause um, I want to hear them because I, I could use inspiration at any time. So <laughs> I want to know about the eight areas. Yeah. So the, the first, the first F that I, I um, gave my attention to was focus. So I truly believe that, you know, where, the, where your mind goes, the person follows. So if a person thinks about a certain thing, that's what their energy is going to go to. That's what their attitude and behaviors are all going to drift towards, whether for good or for bad. So I learned that, you know, anytime you're thinking about something that is becomes a part of who you are, that becomes attached to your identity. And every single person 
um, acts based on what they think. So no, no action is ever greater than your thoughts. So the greater your thought life, the greater your actions, the worse your thought life, the worse your actions. So this you know, your action- a common thing. I have to, because this, I've at least said your thoughts and actions shape your reality. That's like my motto. And that's what I, I'm a health coach. And, you know, that's something that on this podcast, I, I would say at least five guests we've talked about your thoughts and actions shape your reality. That is so, so true. Mm, absolutely. So true. Ugh. And either, whether they're good or bad, yeah, they're going to shape yeah. your reality. Just like, just what you said. So, you know, and the quote that I use, I think I reference in the book is that your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. So whatever you see your life drifting into, it's, it's not there by an accident. It's, it's something that you subconsciously or consciously thought about. And then your attitude and behaviors and actions reflected that thought and brought you to this point of where you're at right now in your life. And some people don't want to hear that because uh, and this is tough. This is like tough love. But if you're in a crappy situation, I, I hate to say it because I used to be very, I used to coddle people even in my training and personal trainer and food and whatever. Now I'm a lot more rougher, but whatever situation that you're in, you've created it. Do you believe that? Like you created it. I would say in, in many cases, yes. I, I wouldn't say a hundred percent of the time. I feel like there are some outside factors, but I feel like for the most part, people have a huge impact on what happens in their life. There's obviously other factors that we can, we can discuss, but I think that people ultimately, they get to decide. Um, they're obviously influenced by other, you know, upbringing and, and things like that. But, you know, I mean, we, we do get to choose what we do with those thoughts. We can mm-hmm. either, you know, if they're toxic, negative thoughts, we can learn how to um, get rid of them or we mm-hmm. can learn to accept the positive ones and act on it. So, I mean, thinking it's a skill. You know, it's a mm-hmm. skill that needs to be developed. Mm. Being conscious, being conscious of your thoughts, right? Yeah, right. That is a that is a skill. I mean, we go around and we're, we see people just like in the clouds, you know. And I'm I'm a very spiritual person, and I practiced yoga for a long time and meditation. And to see all those those people out there, it's I feel sorry for some people because they live in like this cloud they're not conscious of what they're doing or what they're saying. So it is a skill. It's definitely still to be conscious of what you're saying and doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Is that your first step? Is that the first area you focus on? Okay. And then after that, I talk about um, the next F, which is finances. You know what I mean? So going through what I went through, I was, you know, financially, I was in a different state because, you know, I really wasn't working. Um, But I had a, I had a lot of support from people, you know what I mean? And when you have that support, it's great. And I think anytime you have a dream in your life, you know, there's going to be some cost to it, you know, and if you're financially uh, educated and responsible uh, with the financial resources you've been given, you're going to be more prepared to pursue your dream because you can have the greatest dreams and ambition in the world. But if you don't have the, um, the money to fund the dream, it's going to be much more difficult to make it happen. So I feel like people need to be very careful with what they do with their money because your money reveals your heart. What you spend your money on is going to, is directly tied to what is stored up in your heart. So, you know, if you're spending money on certain things, well, guess what? Those are things that you love. Those are things that you enjoy. And sometimes we, we get so caught up in spending on the wrong things that we don't put it towards the things that matter the most. Hmm. I love that. So money, say that again, money's connected to your heart. Yeah. For wh- wherever you like put that. your money. Like yeah, that. absolutely. Wherever you put your money, um, that's, that's where your heart is. It just, they're, they're, they're directly connected. Yeah. Wow. Cause I, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, when I talk, when I think about spending money, it's always on my health, you know, most, the majority. So I feel good about that. <laughs> <laughs> to your, like I've never heard it put that way and I love that That's absolutely great. okay and and before we continue uh, I think you said your other children so you have other kids yes correct how, how, yes life and children how many kids do you have 
So I have um, two girls as well. Two girls. And that picture behind you, is that you and your wife? Yeah, that one is a beautiful. Yes, it is. Thank beautiful you. Beautiful picture. I love it. That's a Thank nice you. background. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So money connected to your heart. So go ahead. Keep going. So the next one, the next one, I think you're, you're definitely going to love this one. Um, okay. And that's, and I'm that's loving fitness. These. I mean, you know, I mean, um, I, I enjoy working out. Um, I, I know that it's, it's so important to work out, you know, to be physically active, you know I mean? And I think when people hear fitness, um, they think, oh, no, I got to go to a gym. And that's not always true. You don't got to go get a gym membership to get fit. You can get fit right in your house. You don't need Especially to buy now, weights or COVID. equipment. I mean, we're in the more, midst of COVID, uh, yeah. everybody. So I don't know, whenever you listen to this, I think everybody's going to know COVID no matter when they listen to this. Uh, but yeah, we're, we have to make, we have to make, make do with what we have. So a lot of gyms are closed. So yeah, mm -hmm. and you're, and you're right. I mean, I've been in the fitness industry for, I'm 56, probably since I'm 20. So um, right away you think it's a gym and it's like, but true, you can be in a backyard. It's, you know, fresh air. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. You know, and when I touch on fitness in the book, I make reference, it's, it's not only, just physically working out, you know what I mean? That That is a huge part of it. But for me, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the fitness of your mind, you know, exercising your mind and you exercise your mind through doing some of the things that we talked about, you know what I mean? Um, learning a new skill, going to a conference, reading a book, challenging yourself to, to go to a higher level. And, you know, I mean, thinking about what you think about, you know, intentionally thinking. So fitness is, is, is an exercise of your mind and your body. You know, I mean, and it can be painful, but, you know, once you're able to push through the pain, that's where the growth happens. Mm, I love your mindset. Love it. Love it. Wow. Okay. We're on. That was three. Yes. So the next one is one I, I usually make reference to is adults can struggle with this tremendously. Uh, children. I don't think ever struggle with it. I think it's just naturally part of children. And once you become an adult, you can lose this. And that's why it's so important to be intentional about this because it's the easiest to lose once you become an adult. And that is fun. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is because I think once you become an adult, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden it becomes about, I got to work. I got to pay the bills. I got to get to the job. And it's all these responsibilities that are constantly tugging and pulling on us and it can be draining, right? So we become so consumed with the task at life that we have to fulfill that we forget to enjoy the life that we have. And so once you decide to enjoy what you do, life becomes more meaningful because it's hard to be effective in anything you do if you're not enjoying what you do. So I think there's a lot of people doing, you know, going to job, doing the work, whatever it is that they're doing, they're not enjoying it. So they're not really able to have a fulfilled life. And that, and that bleeds over into everything else from, you know, their finances, their fitness and their relationships are all affected because if you're, if you're literally miserable constantly because of what you do for work or just your mindset, then it's going to impact and infect everyone around you. Amen. Amen. And I'd like, I don't know if you know my history, but I put, put it on my YouTube channel. I, my story, we all have a story and this is true. People who have been abused, um, you know, that fun, you know, that the meaning of fun, I didn't know it, you know, that ended at age nine when I was sexually abused and, uh, nine to 12. And then the life just drained out of me. And that's why at 56, I'm the most immature 56 year old that probably ever meet, but it's okay. I actually did a TikTok on this, you know, love me for me, but um, they, people on TikTok know my story. Um, I'm reliving it. I'm reliving my youth and having a damn good time doing it because you are so right that when I have my two grandchildren, I'm the funnest grandmother is because I'm the one playing football with them out in the back. My, well, they're little, but I'll toss the ball and I run and I tackle them and I twirl them. And I'm like, I'm reliving my youth. And it has telling my story since I'm probably 50 has revamped my whole life because I put that fun back into my life because I didn't know what it meant 
to laugh and have fun. And I have five kids and I'm the world's okayest mom. I have a shirt that says that because I was just okay because I didn't know how to be fun because I didn't have that as a kid. Well, you're never too old. You're not. And you are right. so right. And it's changed my life because I love being old. I don't mind getting older. I don't mind it because I'm like, this is a whole new life for me. This is what it's supposed to be like. Just running outside and playing and fetching with the dog and laughing with my grandchildren and my kids. And so important. You're so right, Jess. Is it Jesse or Jess? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Jesse. Jesse. Okay. I want to say it wrong. Fun, 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 you guys. Very important. Small word, very important. <laughs> Sorry, I to... Absolutely. I had to say it because as you're talking, I'm like, you see how sensitive I am. I'm getting like choked up just thinking about how important that little word is. Absolutely. Gotta love what you do too. Just, you're so right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting you, but. No, it's all good. Okay, so that was four, right? Absolutely. All right, I'm excited for the other four. All right, so the next <laughs> one, the next one is, is to me, it, it's one of the most important, but it's also the one that I had the most challenging time to write about. Um, I believe every single one of us, no matter what age we are, have mixed feelings about this, um, but it is necessary and it's important, and that is family. Hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of times we, we may not have the most ideal upbringing in life, and there may be some things that we witnessed or experienced that a child may maybe should not have experienced or witnessed, um, and sometimes the opposite is true. You know, I mean, sometimes we've had great experiences growing up and, and a great home and a great family life. You know what I mean? So I, I touch on the importance of that and, you know, some family traditions and, and what I've learned, you know, when, from creating my own family is that I had to make a decision. Once I had a family of my own, I had to reflect back on my family of origin and decide what am I going to bring with me into my family and what am I going to leave behind? And unfortunately, early on, I brought in some things from family of origin, maybe that I shouldn't have some things that I witnessed or experienced or habits that I poured into my marriage into my own kids and not realizing, you know what, this is carried on for generations. And I have now brought it into my marriage and to my children, not realizing it was connected to my, my upbringing. And then there was also other things in my upbringing that, you know, what I intentionally chose to bring with me on purpose because I knew that they were beneficial and they were helpful. So uh, the, the part of family is so important. We got to decide as adults, what am I going to leave behind from what, how I was raised and what am I going to bring with me from how I was raised and mm -hmm. to try to make the best possible decision to leave behind the toxic and negative things that were part of our upbringing and be intentional about striving to push the positive things to the next generation. Mm, and I love that too. And just weeding off from the last thing I said, that's why I said I was the world's okayest mom because I wasn't conscious then and I was just doing what I learned from my upbringing. My brother was in Vietnam and he had severe PTSD, my oldest brother. I came from 11 children and uh, he had bouts of PTSD and would beat me and we were afraid of him and he committed suicide um, when I was nine. Oh, um, I'm sorry. To yeah. Thank you. But um, I learned from him this, the voice that he used and I had PTSD from him committing suicide and plus being abused right after that. Um, but I brought that into my marriage with my kids and I'm here to say and I hope, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but it's never too late. It's never too late to change. And I was never too proud to tell my kids I'm wrong, um, to you know, not be that person where I'm the mom and I'm always right. I always sat down with them and I apologize. And I said, this is where I came from. It doesn't make it right, but this is what I was brought up with. 
I don't know if you agree with me, but I never think it's too late. And I am things that I learned that I did wrong with my kids. I'm, I'm, I know consciously what to do with my grandchildren now and not Mm -hmm. make that mistake again. Right. And also I would say, and I don't know if you just what you mean by family, family doesn't always have to mean blood either. Like it could be that group of people that you've known all your life that maybe aren't connected by blood, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and what you're saying there is, is so true. And it, and it segues into the next F, which is friendship, because I truly believe that, you know, a lot of the friends that I've, friendships that I've built over the years, I don't really look at them as friends. They're, they're like my brothers. That's my family. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. they have showed me what family is all about. You know, I've been able to, been able to return the favor. You know, friendship is not, it, it is something that is mutual. You know, if you have one, if you have a one-sided um, friend, um, who always calls you when they need something, but is not able to do, you know, something to return the favor. And that's not why you do things for people. But at the same time, it needs to be a mutual um, respect for each other, a love for each other. I have your back. And it's this mutual thing. And, and it's just such a uh, interesting way to look at life is like, these are my friends. Yes. Um, biologically, we're not related, but relationally, we're closer than blood. And, you know, I truly believe that you become who you hang with. So if you are hanging out with people who are successful, then success is on its way. If you're hanging out with people who are on the wrong path, the wrong path is going to be creeping up on you very, very soon. So that's why I think we need to be intentional about who we decide to allow into our inner circle of people. Who are we going to allow to become our friends? Because when I, when I'm picking my friendships, you know, part of that is I, I understand that I have a wife and I have kids when I pick these friendships. And I want to be friends with men, the kind of men that I hope my daughters marry someday, because they're going to grow up and see how I behave and how I act and carry myself. And they're also going to see the kind of men that I hang with. And I want them to show, I want my, me and my friends to show them, this is how men act and this is how we behave. And hopefully that can inspire them to pursue uh, a, a, a man at some point in their life when they do decide to get married that has a you know man of of love and respect and integrity and honesty and generosity and kindness because these are things that I talk about with my kids and so if I'm going to talk about it with them I need to be living it out when I walk out of the house you know I need to be having those relationships so they can see this is what friendship looks like so true and you know I talked about this on another podcast also four boys I have four boys and then the baby she's 23 is the girl and I'm okay about saying this, but my daughter, I adores her father. Be, and, and it makes me, so, and, I, and she'll j- joke around. I, I love daddy more than you, mom, you know? I, I don't think that's true, but it makes me feel good that my daughter respects her dad, just like you say. And the reason why is because she sees the way her father treats me and how kind he is and how he would do anything for anybody. And you are so right, because my daughter is going to be doing, looking for somebody like that or whoever she picks or whatever it is. Um, so important, so important. And you have two girls, so yeah. Yeah, and, and your friends are going to, they're going to push you one direction or the other. You know I mean, and I've, I've made it a point to have friends who hold me accountable and hold me to a higher standard. So if I'm if I'm saying all these things that I'm sharing on these podcasts and in a book and these speeches, I have these friends that can call me out and say, hey, man, you're talking about all these things, but you're not doing it. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? You're right. I messed up there and I, sh- I need to change that. So they hold me accountable to the standards that I that I talk about. And do you really this. answer it that way? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you yeah, get, I mean, I have, I have a couple of my, yeah, you know, you know what, because be, I, I would say that I used to, but I'm at the point where like, you know what, if, if I'm going around saying these things and I'm talking about the importance of friendship and the importance of having that accountability, if I'm going to get mad at you for holding me to the standard that I told you to hold me to, that's something wrong with me. And right. so I, I just got to accept it. You know I mean? I may, it may not always feel good, uh, but it's really not about my feelings. It's about my future. Yeah. I love the way you, you are, Jesse. Love it. Thank you. So, and how old are you? 33. Yeah, I love it. I love, I'm so, so good about this next generation and uh, it's beautiful. You're so young. 
Uh, so we're on. I think we have two more. We do. Um, the next one is, man, this one in the book, this was hard to write. And it's, and it's even harder to live out. I mean, this one is not easy, but it's, it's so necessary. Um, and it's forgiveness. Because the thing about that is, first of all, for me, is, is understanding that I, I am forgiven. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes and, and hurt a lot of people in my life and have not lived up to even my own standards at times and have not um, discovered my purpose until later on in life. And so I, I spent many, many years living somebody else's life, pursuing their dreams and goals and, and not my own. You know what I mean? So I have to ask for forgiveness for that. And I know that I'm you know, eternally forgiven and also learning how to ask for forgiveness to other people, you know, that I've wronged and I've hurt. And, that, and that's a pride thing. You know, and I struggled for years with that. You know, I could do something disrespectful to my wife and then not even apologize for it because in my heart of hearts, I was right. And you should be apologizing to me. And so pride is what gets in the way of forgiveness. You know what I mean? And, and we all want forgiveness, but not everybody wants to give it. Like everybody's all about, you know, please, 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 you know, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, you know, but at the same time, um, when someone wrongs us, all of a sudden we, we may withhold that from other people and want them to mm -hmm. suffer, but re really it's us who suffers, you know, and forgiveness is the true, it is the lock. And when you have a key of forgiveness, it, it can break any deadbolt lock, any combination lock when you got that key, because all of a sudden everything that you felt trapped by, um, all of a sudden you become free and the pain doesn't mean that it just automatically disappears, but what it does is it starts to free you bit by bit, year by year, week by week, and month by month. That doesn't, it doesn't excuse the behavior of someone who's wronged you, um, but it excuses you to move forward. And that's what I truly I believe. It. Forgiveness is to take one step forward. Forgiveness, a lack of forgiveness means continued focus of the past hurts. When you give complete in immediate full forgiveness, you're able to now appreciate the present moment and you're able to look ahead with hope. Love it, love it. I mean, I, you know, forgave, forgave the priest who abused me really fully. And, and the way I did that was just to think about what a hard life he must have had to not excusing his acts and what he did to me, but I thought about how hard his life must have been to abuse an innocent girl or whoever he did abuse in his life. But it did set me free for sure. For sure. We have one more. One more. One more. All right. So the final one, and to me is what, what motivates everything that I do, everything that I do, every decision I make comes from this one. And for me, that's faith. And not everybody obviously agrees with me on the concept of faith. Everybody has their own idea of what it means to them. Um, but for me, that's the foundation of which I build my life on, my marriage on, and my family on it is built on that. Um, and whether people believe in any spiritual beliefs or not, Every single person has faith. They have faith in something. They may have faith in God, and some people don't have faith in God. They may have faith in a person. They may have faith in a paycheck or a job or the economy. Everyone has faith in something. Or the universe. And everybody has faith in something. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And what I've just learned is that I want to put my faith in something that does not change and something that can never be taken away from me because everything on earth, can be taken away from us except for one thing that faith can't be taken that that's the one thing you know your family can be taken your money can be taken your health can be taken all that stuff can be taken so i want to put my faith into god is the one thing that can never be taken from me you know and and ironically the name of my daughter who passed away her name was faith and and she taught me a lot about faith because I never, even though there was moments where I was doubting God's existence and how could a loving God yeah. and a powerful, just God allow my daughter to die in my arms? How, what kind of God would do such a thing? Right. You know what I mean? So that, that shook my faith to the core. But I learned through that, that God is not circumstantial. 
whether you had the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, that doesn't change the love and existence and power of God. I'm just thinking about you holding the baby, that's all. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Um, so that's what the book is about. These eight, what do you call them? Eight areas, eight? The eight Fs, because they all start with F, so eight Fs. The okay. Freedom. In the whole book, you talk about each one in depth. Yes. I love it. And then your next book is going to be about what? Oh. Tell me. So the next book is about my daughter in the hospital and what we experienced. So that one's a, at a whole nother level as far as being very personal in our journey leading up to it while we're in there and how our lives have changed and adapted since. So that's an autobiography of, of her life story. And um, when did this happen with your daughter? How long 2017. ago was that? 2017. So since then you've written the book, right? You've yep. written this book. And what else are you doing? Tell me. So I, I wrote the one we just talked about, and then I'm almost, you know, I'm getting closer to the one that I'm writing now. Um, mm -hmm. I've also written a movie script that's going to be based on this as well. So there's a script in the works. So I'm hoping based to on it. your daughter, or based on the. Yep. It, it's kind of it's based on our, I my daughter, and it's also based on how me and my wife met. So you know we've experienced a lot of. Um, interesting life experiences between her and I. Um, and I feel like it's definitely um, beneficial for us to share our story. You know what I mean? So I'm taking a lot of contents from the second book and, and putting them in there. And so, yeah, it's going right. to be a, it's going to be a movie about our daughter for sure. Well, this has been a really great, <sighs> inspiring talk. I didn't know where we were going to go with this, but I'm so glad we went over these things the eight things of the, I, I feel so connected to you in all of these. I don't know if you felt that for me, but I really feel connected to you. Is there anything else you want to share with me, um, with the audience? So, I mean, that, for, for those listening, you know, I mean, if I could throw out one more thing is, is for people to realize that that pain that you went through was not meant to destroy you. It was meant to rebuild you. It was meant to guide you and to focus you towards your path and plan in life. Because without the, without the adversity of pain, your character cannot grow. And when you have big dreams, your character must grow into those dreams. And understanding that you are gifted greatly. And when you're gifted greatly, you will be tested greatly. And when you're able to get through those tests, you're able to get to the gift. And that gift is going to impact the world. Because anytime any human being shares their gift with the world, they make the world a better place. And there is people counting on me and there's people counting on you who are depending and need your gift to make this world a better place. And it's up to us to receive the gift we've been given and share it with the world. Well, I don't need last words of wisdom from you then. Because that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to ask you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I want to know where people can get in touch with you. All the information will be in the show notes. So you don't have to, you know, you can just tell me you want on social media. What? Yeah. So for people want to connect with me. Yeah. I mean, I'm on Facebook, um, Jesse Cruz or on the business page, Jesse A. Cruz on Instagram, author Jesse Cruz. I'm on there. Um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and people want to contact me by email, author Jesse Cruz at gmail.com. And for my books, they're on barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com, or people can order directly from me. Is it on audio? Currently working on that. Good. I've been to, I've had at least three or four people who've, who've had books. And I, I love reading, but I just have no time to read. So, but I do have time for audio because I'm running or I'm doing more than walking around, doing my stuff around the kitchen. I can always listen. So I'm definitely going to get that book. Um, hang out for one second. Uh, wait, do you have a website? Current, like I said, that's another thing. Currently working on that as well. That's under construction. Okay. But best way to get right. me is, uh, social media and email right now. I got you. Everything's going to be in the show notes, you guys. So. I happen to have one of my raw bars here, you guys. This is one of my favorites right now. Uh, this is cookie dough. 
okay? And for anybody who listens to me knows that I am an affiliate and an ambassador of the Raw Bar. They do not sponsor me, but my affiliate link will be below. This is the only packaged good I eat. It is vegan, but any it fits any diet. It is protein packed uh, with 18 to 21 grams of protein a bar, 11 to 13 net carbs, no artificial sweeteners, put together by coconut oil, which is really good for your brain, coconut nectar, blackstrap molasses, and Himalaya salt. Owned by Jake and Rachel, a very young couple from Minnesota, beautiful people. Go to my affiliate link, you will learn all about them. If you order from that link, it benefits me and it benefits them. 10% of their net proceeds go to feed the hungry children worldwide. And if you go on their uh, website, you'll see them in action. They're just beautiful people. Um, all my information will be in the show links, uh, the links below. Uh, again, if you guys can support me, subscribe. I'm on every major platform, uh, YouTube. Um, subscribe, comment, like, share. Thank you so much. And on that note, Thank you very much, Jesse. I really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful and blessed day, everybody. Take care. I can't end this. Why?